Hey everybody, uh, this is Name Your Game, a video game podcast brought to you by SharkTank.com. Each episode, we have a new guest with us so we can talk about their favorite games from the past and present. So this is Dane. And I'm Tim. And here we have with us... He is a game developer, uh, the founder of Pocket Watch Games, who brought you Monaco, among others. He is Andy Schatz. How's it going, Andy? I'm doing great. I'm uh, pleased to be here with you this evening. Hopefully, hopefully I got your name right. Schatz, is that... Yeah, you shot, shot, shots, shots, shit, okay. shits, shits. <laughs> yeah, wait. I'm sure you get that a lot. <laughs> yeah, shits, party of four, shits. Uh, um, uh, no, it's, it's uh, if you want to be uh, all correct about it, uh, go with shots. But um, I, uh, I hear shots a lot. Yes. Okay, cool. <laughs> Thanks for clearing that up. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, uh, uh, so we might as well just let's get right into it. Yeah. We got a we got a question for you, Andy, um, and and we really want you to think hard about the answer. Okay. Yeah, bring it. Well, what is your favorite video game of all time? Favorite video game of all time. You know, there's obviously a zillion different answers to this. And my, the, the games that I, the game I'm going to give you is my favorite game of all time is actually not good anymore. Um, but <laughs> well, that's, I'm but, sure it's a matter of opinion. Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe. <laughs> uh, so when I was a kid, I played games with my dad. Mm-hmm. And I uh, the one that I think made the biggest impact on me was Ultima 4. And uh, Ultima 4, so it's an RPG, right? It's a, mm-hmm. a sort of a traditional tile-based Dungeons and Dragons RPG. Yeah. Sure. And the um the lead ca- or the, the character that you're playing is the Avatar. And the whole point of the game is that you weren't trying to kill evil Foozle. You were trying to um become the Avatar, which is what was like you were trying to become perfect in the eight different virtues of the world, um, which were like valor, honor, sacrifice, compassion, all mm-hmm. these things. And I remember that I would go to school. I was in like first grade at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'd go to school. And at the end of the day, I would rate myself in those eight different virtues, like how well I did that day. Because wow. I was, because one day I would become the avatar. Of course. And, That's so cool. And yeah, it's, it's so cool because it's like, you know, people talk a lot about like, are video games able to make people bad? And for mm-hmm. me, you know, when people ask me that question, I, I actually tell them yes, because for me, video games helped to make me good. Yeah. And uh, I actually embrace the idea that like video games can be influential in our lives and video games can change who we are, or at least if we want them to change who we are, um, if we allow them to change who we are, they they have that kind of power. Um, so so that's probably, you know, why I'm a video game maker today. I, I think that's about the same time that I started making my own games. I, I programmed my first game when I was seven. So um, oh my gosh. Uh, that's when I, you know, really became passionate about games. And yeah, it's, it's really not a very good game anymore, but um, <laughs> uh, it definitely is like, it definitely is hugely inf- influential for me. Yeah. And there's a lot of games from back then, especially computer games, like computer games from like the early nineties, just the controls back then were so awful, but it doesn't necessarily make the game bad just because controls have evolved so much and games are so much easier to play. Right. They still have their own charm and ex- with any type of art, you have to look at it from the lens of its time period, right? Otherwise, right. You're, you're putting an, a, an unfair bias on the artwork. Mm-hmm. So I can totally see why that would be considered. Fit. Also, I do think that, that video games can have an influence on you. I don't know that I would necessarily say that a g- video game can make you bad, but mm-hmm. I think it could influence you in a negative way that with other you know external influences could lead you down the wrong path. Oh. Oh, of course. Yeah. 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 I mean, a video game is not going to going to literally control your mind and tell you to go shoot, <laughs> shoot sure, up a yeah, school. Yeah. Right. Um, no, that's yeah. silly. But yeah, you know, all, all sorts of things like are the, the movies and everything that we that we watch can make us evolve as people. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I mean, I was about to say it's not really only video games. Uh, you know, I think all mediums, if they kind of uh, show you a message in such a way that makes it out to be something that is good or is worth, Mm -hmm. you know, repeating that could uh, influence people, especially younger people to go about their lives that way. And right. Right. Well, certainly (laughs) books, no one's going to deny that like reading a book could change someone's mind about something. So why, why would we ever deny that that's true of video games? Yeah, exactly. um, and, and yeah, it's, I just think that it's our responsibility as game creators. We, we should make whatever we want. And a lot of times, a lot of times games are built to be satirical, you know, and they're, mm-hmm. they, they're, it's, it's not like it's not okay to have a violent video game or even games in which you, it makes you do things that like you wouldn't do in real life. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's, it's also like, 
we have a lot of power in our hands. So it's uh, so it's kind of cool to be able to to wield that artistic power and bring interesting messages to to yeah. our audiences. Oh yeah, you know? I can imagine. You know, with video games, they're so immersive and so so much more interactive than a book. You know what I mean? You know, right. I, not that books are bad. I love reading and and, and <laughs> books are book. bad. <laughs> I hate books. Books no. will make you shoot schools. Yeah, it's a Fahrenheit well, 41 you know, the, Maybe they'll make you uh, shoot John Lennon, but that's that's another case altogether. Um, what I was going to say was, you know, books have their own charm in that they, they put more of the creative vision in your eyes because you get to imagine, you know, and right. you're reading it, but you're imagining, and whereas totally. you're seeing stuff in a video game. But video games are so much more interactive, so much more immersive than a book can be that it's definitely going to influence you. It'd be silly to say otherwise. Yeah. yeah it's it's interesting with, with Monaco. Monaco has such a like um, uh, symbolic art style that mm-hmm. people manage to sort of really get into the environment, despite the fact that the art is so, uh, you know, symbolic and not realistic. Sure. Um, mm-hmm. And because they, they know that the game is expecting them to imagine the actual environment and the people and the way they're talking and um, mm-hmm. rather than sort of handing it to them half ass. And so, you know, that was that was actually the reason that that I originally decided to use uh, silent movie piano music for Monaco's score because sure. I wanted to sort of trigger that feeling of like I'm, it's almost like a silent movie where you're having to imagine what people are saying. Um, by mm-hmm. using that that music, it's supposed to sort of trigger the idea that oh yeah, I'm supposed to actually use my imagination to imagine what's actually happening here. Sure. Definitely, it was a great design decision. I mean, it really fit uh, uh, the kind of the feel of the game. So yeah, you definitely uh, uh, did a good job conveying that. Well, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. I mean, I, it's no it's no surprise. It's no secret that uh, at this point that Monaco is a great game. I mean, it's been so extremely successful. Yeah. So I'm sure that's been pretty surreal. You know, yeah, I, I I do have a question about Monaco. Um, it. It, it, something that's been relevant in recent times is, uh, you know, Let's Plays. And there's there have been a lots of positivity and lots of negativity, like, uh, you know, Phil Fish comes to mind in the negative side of things. But uh, <laughs> as someone whose game is, you know, I we actually have friends who do Let's Plays and they've done Monaco and there's all sorts of people on the internet doing, le- yeah, you know, we Monaco Let's Plays. doing Monaco for our own Let's Plays at we Shark We were going Tank. to, but uh, awesome. we had a lag issue. And, uh, you know, maybe we still in the future with the enhanced campaign, <laughs> which is really cool, by the way. But anyway, that's, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm going on a tangent here. What's your opinion on Let's Plays in general as someone who has, who created a game that has been so widely played on YouTube and other sources? Sure. Well, they're better than podcasts, that's for sure. <laughs> Ouch. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. I, I think Let's Plays are fantastic. You've probably noticed that Monaco has been on sale in a variety of different ways a lot over the past year and a half since it mm-hmm. came out in, in April. And um, the reason for that is that I really like the idea that different people place different value on games and they consume games in different ways. And I want to be able to accommodate all of those people. You know, for some people, Monaco is a $15 game or it's a $40 game that they want to buy for their friends or it's only a, you know, it's a $1 Humble Bundle purchase. And in the same ways, I think Let's Plays cater to to a lot of people that are like, you know, they just, they really kind of, they don't want to buy all these games. They kind of just want to experience them. But there's no question that Let's Plays are causing more people to buy games. Yeah. And it's, you know, yet another way that people can experience games um, in Let's Absolutely. Plays. So, so yeah, I think that, I think they're fantastic. The more different ways, they're more, more different sort of entry points for people to play games, or even if someone never plays games and literally only ever watches Let's Plays, you know what? That's fine by me. It just means that those people are sort of adding themselves to the social conversation about games and, uh, Oh, the yeah. more of that, the more of that, the better. Yeah. I mean, think about like back in the day, we had situations where kids would would see a game in a store or go to a friend's house and see a mm-hmm. game and think it looked so cool that they went around and it was a word of mouth type situation. Like, oh, right. my gosh, I saw this game at so and so's house. He just got it for his birthday and we played it and it was amazing. I mean, now kids can pull up games on YouTube or, or anyone of any age can pull up a game on YouTube on a Let's Play, watch it. And then at work or at school, I mean, that would be the same kind of scenario. Like, oh, I was watching them play this game on YouTube and it looked so cool. These different types of characters had these abilities. And I mean, really, it's just more, it's more, uh, uh, Advertisability. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and definitely. and it's um it it's something where uh that actually really helps us indies too. Yeah. Uh because 
you know, Minecraft would not have been as big as it is. Um, oh, although, no. <laughs> uh, you know, and Minecraft is sort of the original let's play game mm -hmm. and uh, sold for what? 2.5 billion to Microsoft this week. Yeah. Which is, which is pretty freaking exciting. I I'm yeah. actually yeah. largely excited for Notch simply because I know how difficult it is to be creative when you still have an old game hanging over your head. Right. And so I'm, I'm really excited for him to be able to, to move on and just start completely clean slate, making new stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. I agree. You know, whatever he wants. So yeah, I, I was going to say at this point, he can literally do anything that he wants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 But it's great to see that what he wants to do is to continue to make games, new, creative, interesting games, as opposed to sure. just retire on an island somewhere. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to lie. That's what I would have done. I know. I tell you what, when I, one day when I retire, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make board games in my garage. I'm nice. gonna give up, oh, brilliant. You know what? Cause I, cause I love the, the game design part and I actually really enjoy programming, but there are definitely days when like the, the act of running a business is a drag. So I can imagine. <laughs> I, I, uh, yeah, I can definitely see that. <laughs> so are you a big tabletop gamer then or? I, I, I don't want to oversell myself on that. I love tabletop games, but I, I, I wish I had more people to play them with, but I, but I, I, I do, <laughs> I do my share, you know, I, sure. uh, uh, I've been playing some Forbidden Island lately, which is sort of un unfortunately similar to Pandemic, but sure. both of them I quite well, enjoy. Made, made by the same guy, so. Same guy, yeah. It's really interesting, actually, to see a designer actually break his own game down and make it less complex. Usually when people revisit their games, they want to go back and actually like add in the features that the previous ones were missing. Well, that's um, kind of what he did with Forbidden Desert. Mm -hmm. Right. Was he right. took kind of the same formula, but then changed it wildly. I, I've only seen Forbidden Desert being played. I haven't had a chance to play it yet myself, but it looks it looks pretty different from the other two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's it built on something similar, and then it goes in a wildly different direction. Yeah, for sure. Uh, uh, so uh, you mentioned that uh, you know if you were ever incredibly financially successful that you would make <laughs> tabletop games in your garage. Uh, do you see yourself ever making a tabletop game just in the near future, you know, under, under the pocket watch games? Oh, name? who knows? I would, I mean, I'd love to, um, I, that's what I did before Monaco. I was, uh, well, I, it's not really, it, it's sort of what I did. Um, I was in a period where I was, where I was kind of stuck on designing my next game. This was, this was pre Monaco. I was working on an, an, a dinosaur ecosystem simulator, sure. um, which I actually still want to revisit at some point. But I just couldn't, I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't figure out how to, to make it fun. I just didn't, couldn't find sure. the magic on it. And so I kept like taking breaks. And as, as my, you know, my breaks from solo development, what I would do is just design board games of a, on a variety of subjects. So nice. I actually built a, a Monaco board game before I started on the, the video game itself. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, it was a, it was neat. It was, it was before the sort of all of the co-op board games were coming out. And, uh, um, it was a co-op board game in which it was to your advantage to, um, to betray the team at some point <laughs> so that sure. you would walk away with all the loot. But if you betray right, your sure. team too early, then no one would would trust you and oh yeah you know you wouldn't be they wouldn't be give, helping you out basically like everyone's trying to help each other out because everyone wants to get as much loot as they possibly can but mm -hmm. at the end of the day you want you you really want to betray other people when they're in a position to not be able to defend themselves or betray you back sounds so, like a cutthroat caverns yeah 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 similar yeah yeah so uh yeah it was interesting with it and it was a um basically the each time you went in the mansion would be a little different and then the guards would have some sort of patrol routes that would have you know be moved in between turns that kind of thing so uh yeah super yeah. fun no that Very could be cool. really cool absolutely so are have you seen uh Gollum Arcana or um the Fantasy Flight's uh, upcoming game the XCOM the board game they're two I have not so they're games that actually have a tablet app that goes along with the game okay so it's half video game half tabletop game and it's it's a really cool mix it's you know, there's other games in the past. I don't know if you're familiar with Space Alert or Escape, mm -hmm. uh, Curse of the Temple. You know, games yep. that use like soundtracks that are necessary for the gameplay. Right, right, right. Gollum Arcana and specifically is really cool because it's a miniatures game, but the tablet basically does everything in terms of keeping track of your miniatures HP, their attack. It rolls the dice for you and it comes with a, a wand that... Uh, it's Bluetooth. Yeah, it's a Bluetooth wand that connects to huh. a tablet and then you kind of tap the different miniatures and it brings up their sheet and it shows their stats and you can cycle through their abilities and then you tap the enemy when you want to use an attack on it and things like it's, that. It's really cool. And it even Super has, cool. yeah, it even has the little CG models of, of, 
you know, your, your figures and right. the terrain, like right there on the screen that, you know, goes yeah. along with it. It's very cool. There's so much you can do by, by digitalizing board games. I mean, if you look yeah. at like, look at the difference between Hearthstone and Magic. I, mm-hmm. Personally, I'm a Magic fan. Yeah. It, but I like, I do like Hearthstone. But one of the things that Hearthstone's allowed to do because they're, because it's, it's a video game yeah. is, is having individual HP per, per unit or per card. Right. Yeah. Whereas know, that would be a, such a hassle to track if it was, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and like if you, if you, if you, before, if, you know, before Hearthstone came out, if you sat down and were trying to, to build a Magic variant of some yeah. sort, the first thing you think of, of, of course, is that each of these guys has their own HP because it's weird that they, that you do damage to them, but it doesn't actually kill or it doesn't actually hurt them. Mm -hmm. Um, And then you realize how awful that would be to actually track in person. Yeah, exactly. There's limitations and and something else uh, in in regard to Hearthstone versus Magic. And I think we've mentioned this a couple times on the show before is we love how Blizzard can easily patch overpowered cards anytime they want. Right. uh, Whereas, you know, Wizards of the Coast has to just (laughs) make them go away forever. Yeah, just ban (laughs) them from tournaments or whatever. Uh, Yeah. And it's just such an interesting you know, difference. Yeah, and back to Golem Arcana, something that it's able to do, which is huge for tabletop gaming, is there's a tutorial. And <laughs> the app teaches you the game. You don't oh, cool. actually have to crack open the rule book unless you want to. The app right. will teach you everything you need to know through a couple tutorial levels. And that, you know, that that for me saves me the five hours that I spend studying the rule book and then the the misinterpreting ten rules and then the two hours that I spend trying to teach the game to my friends and utter you know, utterly failing and then they all get frustrated <laughs> totally, and then no one man. wants to play that game again. <laughs> yeah. Where's my where's my Netrunner app? Yeah. Jesus, those those the rule book and Netrunner are so bad. Oh, well, that's that's fantasy flight for you. Speaking of Netrunner, <laughs> I love that game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> oh man, but but let's let's talk more about video games. Yeah, yeah, we'll get back to a to a realm that Dane's more familiar with. I'm yeah. the tabletop I, guy. I, I really like tabletop, and I, I I couldn't not become more familiar with it living here with this guy. <laughs> but but yeah, obviously uh, it's not as much of a hobby for me. All right. What I wanted to ask is, is you mentioned that Ultima 4 is one of the most influential games for you, one of your favorite games of all time. Is there a game more recently, maybe within the last five years or so, that oh, sure. it, yeah. you know, is sort of like the modern equivalent of that for you? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a totally different type of game, but Journey That's for okay. me was Journey for me was a a big one, and it's such a small game, mm-hmm. but it's it's just a beautiful, beautiful experience. My um, absolutely, my wife had just like gotten through cancer she, at the time, oh, man. and playing through the game with like you know she sat with me and played through it, and the person in the world like. I was just imagining that the partner in the world was her. Um, you know, wow. we were going going through our various, you know, it was sort of, a, you can imagine it being sort of the story of a relationship of two people, uh, yeah. and, you know, through ups and downs and all of that. And, and, and then, you know, coming out the other side. And, and it's so funny because like when I finished that first game, it was like, you know, you've been playing with T Gordy, T, T Gordo Jr. 69. <laughs> <You know? laughs> oh, man. No, that that's my wife. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but all jokes aside, the way you described it, that's a really beautiful way of looking at that game. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. It was it was incredible. Beyond that, probably my second favorite game from my childhood was was XCOM. And I thought mm-hmm. they did a great job with the XCOM reboot. Yeah. I mean, the, the first XCOM is sort of the... You know, I wouldn't. I don't want to say the original roguelike because Rogue was the original roguelike, but uh, right. <laughs> but XCOM for me, at least in terms of sort of emergent storytelling, was just so fantastic with regards to you know really making you care about your characters mm-hmm. and having them have like personalities that felt real to me, even though it's all just stat based stuff. Oh yeah. Um, and for oh, both yeah, of those sure. games, I ended up with like really memorable stories about about you know the whatever hero it was that ended up making it to the end. Yeah, definitely. So. Yeah, that's that. I love I love both those games. And awesome. the, uh, so then I have to assume that the original XCOM was probably a huge influence uh, for your upcoming title then. Yeah, for sure. The original XCOM, probably more so um, early day, early like LAN party days playing Command and Conquer. Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, when yeah. I was in, I think, high school. Um, and uh, that was, you know, th- those days playing Command and Conquer and then playing Red Alert in college 
were uh, were like definitely really formative for me. And I remember like towards the end of high school, I was building real time strategy games, or I was trying to build a real time strategy game of my own. Um, the, the, actually, that's kind of the very first time I designed my upcoming game or a version of my upcoming game. Towards the end of high school, I was designing a like side scrolling uh, real time strategy game that was like is basically like imagine an ant farm except with giant huh. like ca- caterpillar style drills and trucks and things like that. Sure. And, but then throw in some like pixel junk shooter type elements like you're trying to flood the other guy's caverns with lava and okay. and such. That sounds and then, awesome actually. And yeah, and then in college that sort of morphed into I started working with a friend on a game called Dino Drop that was a top-down real-time strategy game with autonomous units in hmm. in which you had a limited selection of different dinosaurs that you could build <laughs> and you would like scroll around the world, you could drop an egg into the world after after a certain amount of time the egg would hatch and then the dinosaur itself would sort of go about its business or do you know, act autonomously and you were trying to take over territory from the other guy's uh, uh, dinosaurs. Um, and that's really kind of the predecessor to Lead to Fire, which is what I'm working on now. Yeah, right. So uh, why don't you explain Lead to Fire a little bit m- more detail uh, for yeah. people who are unfamiliar? Sure. Yeah. Lead to Fire is a, uh, we describe it as an arcade real-time strategy game. I love StarCraft, um, but I kind of hate playing it. <laughs> because, I, I, that, you're not the first person who said that to me. Uh, yeah. And uh, I find it exhausting and I, I, I uh, do struggle with the controls. Um, and I, I, you know, I don't think that's entirely sour grapes. I think that it's because uh, I'm old. <laughs> oh, yeah. I know what you mean. And I, you know, I, I would prefer to be, be able to play a real-time strategy game in, in which the controls just got out of the way and it feels like a battle of wits and not a battle of clicks. Yeah. And... So what we've done here is we call it an arcade real-time strategy game because I like the idea that that anyone could just walk up to it and begin playing it no matter what. So there's basically two buttons in the game. Uh, You can play on a controller or mouse keyboard. Um, On a controller, the A button will build a, a... whatever structure you're currently highlighted and the the trigger will pull your army your entire army to your current position you have a player character so it's not like a tra- traditional traditional rts so you have a, this rat that's running around the world you can you can uh, build structures or fa- factories that autonomously produce units and then you pull your army to your current position so uh what we're trying to do is like basically take the controls and get them completely out of the way and make it much more about like what units counter what and the positions of the various different buildings that you create. So, you know, are my positioning my turrets correctly? And then am I countering the enemy's unit composition correctly? And then like the games, a single game session is just three to 12 minutes or so. So you can get a lot more like rematches in, which is interesting because we have a deck building mechanic in there too. You design your own race. So rather than playing Zerg or Protoss or Terran, you actually slot up to somewhere between six and eight different unit types. Um, so that, that's a feature that that really excites me because it, it seems like when you in a game like StarCraft where you have set races, you almost like you almost get stuck in terms of what play style based on the race right. you want exactly. to choose. Uh, and this gives you so much more flexibility. Yeah, if you're the type of player that likes to turtle up in their base, you can do, build a turtling deck. And then because the game sessions are so short, it's it's way better for rematches. You know, you have a, a five-minute match against someone. In laddered play, it's going to be best two of three. So in the second match, you might actually edit your deck. We, you know, we allow you to sideboard uh, two diff- two of your units so that, you know, in the second match, it's like, oh, yeah, he came out with me with flying units in the last match. I'm going to do a bunch of anti or I'm going to swap out for some anti-air in the second match. Um, but then he's thinking to himself, he's probably going to going <laughs> to counter my air. So I'm going to go, you know, whatever, burrowed units or something like that. So uh, so there's a lot more of that like meta game, you know, head games going on. In StarCraft, you're playing against a, diff- a different stranger every single time. So if you're going to play against a stranger every single time, you may as well get good at one strategy and do it over and over and over again. Yeah, um, for sure. Which doesn't really promote like versatility. Right, right. Like uh, improvisation. Um, yeah. And uh, that imp- to me, true strategy is, is, is being able to improvise and adapt. Oh, totally. um, not not being able not just finding one strategy and being able to execute it well yeah so that, uh so that's the focus yeah that sounds extremely appealing like and, and really kind of uh, from my perspective being interested in in the role of a game designer just kind of thinking about how for you i mean i'm sure you think about the types of uh, uh games that you really like but 
you get to improve upon it in, in any way that you want, essentially. You know, you can yep. break it down and think, yep. well, I mean, I want to make this aspect of it more streamlined so I can focus right. on this aspect of it that I find to be the most enjoyable aspect. Yeah, it's funny. Like, I, I my typical approach to game design, this is pretty... Uh, atypical for me in terms of my approach to game design. I, mm -hmm. I typically like to try and find game mechanics in non-game related systems and then uh. build build the system build an interactive system to to match that. So for Monaco, mm -hmm. it was heist movies. And and sure <laughs> we used you know, we used a lot of sort of stealth game mechanics to sort of shortcut our way to, to that, but it wasn't, Monaco's not a game that is like, I want to make stealth. I, I like stealth games, but I want to make them better. It was really like, I want to play Ocean's Eleven, the game. <laughs> In this, this is really the first time as an indie that I've, I've said, you know, I want to take this one game, but make it more appealing to myself. And, and I, I, the reason I try and avoid that is because it's so easy to fall into the trap of making something that is sort of non-remarkable and, and only moves, you know, moves the yardstick forward inch by inch. Sure. Whereas when you're trying to sort of, it's so interesting to take a system that I'm, that I'm passionate about in the, in real, real life and, and try and discover the mechanics within it. So, you know, I've made games that are based, that are about like, you know, ecosystems and how ecosystems work. And I, I still find that to be really interesting or, uh, you know, with heist games um, and, uh, or with, with Monaco, I should say. Um, but, uh, you know, maybe, maybe for me now it's, I, I, I wanted to approach something that, uh, you know, I'm, I've, maybe it's just that I've been playing real time strategy games for so long and, and, mm -hmm. uh, been unsatisfied with them. So I'm happy to be working on this one. Yeah. yeah it's, it, it's a it, noble effort. It is happen. interesting how uh, to see how, because I grew up a huge fan of real time strategy. In fact, funny little anecdote. I played led to fire at PAX okay. and I started playing and you came over to me and you were going to kind of teach me how to play. But then you said, oh, this guy knows what he's doing. And then the rest of the game, you were coaching the, the enemy and I lost. <laughs> and I, I, that's the reason why I lost, of course, is because, you know, the, the opponent had a coach who knew what they were doing. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I honestly forgot what point I was trying to make with this story. God, what have I done? <laughs> well, what I like about that is that that sort of proves the point of it being an arcade real-time strategy game. That like we really are trying to make something that if you know StarCraft, you're going to know how to play the game. It's that like the very first thing you do is you decide, am I going to attack the guy? Am I going to turtle up or am I going to take a risk and go straight econ? Um, and, uh, you know, that's kind of the rock, paper, scissors of real time sure. strategy that, that if you go econ and the guy rushes you, you're dead. And if you, mm -hmm. if you rush the guy and he turtle up, he's going to have an economic advantage. That's and if scout. you turtle up and yeah. And if you turtle up and the other guy goes econ, he's going to have this huge economic advantage because you wasted your money on, on the defense. Yeah. Um, so yeah. And then scouting of course is the wild card and all of that, that like you really have to constantly scout in order to see what the other guy is doing and try and react to him. It's, it's like being able to peek behind the guy, the other guy's back when he's, you know, when his scissors are sitting there behind his back. Sure. But uh, yeah, actually, you know, the one thing that I forgot to describe about the game is is the theme. It's uh, um, it's set in a world of animal revolution in which uh, the animals can't decide who's going to be the meat, um, but <laughs> someone has to be the meat. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so yeah, it's like, it's sort of a, um, imagine like animal farm crossed with like the Russian revolution. Um, <laughs> wow. Uh, so it's well, set in a sort of modern that what animal world farm war. was about in the first place. <laughs> was uh, like... Yeah. Communism kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but imagine, um, yeah, the, this, this one's more about, uh, it's interesting. The backstory gets pretty deep and we'll see how much of that backstory actually comes out through the game once, once cool. we have the single player and co-op campaign. But, uh, sure. Yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty fun. It's like <laughs> basically like all of these various different, different, uh, factions of very different animal species that are trying to sort of vie for who gets to decide who's going to be sent to the butcher shop to feed the people. Sure. So I really like the mice. The mice are my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> or are they rats? You, the commanders, the commanders are the rats, yeah. Rats, and then, gotcha. uh, and we've got swarm mice. This the, one of the tier, the tier one rushing unit is is a mouse. Yeah, they're <laughs> the ranged ones, right? Yeah, we've been adding units like crazy. We just added in um, literal turtles. They're for turtling. It's a tier one turtling <laughs> unit. There you go. Which is kind of awesome. Yeah, uh, we've got how skunk. could you not do that? <laughs> exactly. We've got skunk grenadiers. They bottle up their own stink and throw it at the enemy. Very oh, nice. that's awesome. Siege donkeys are always a crowd favorite. <laughs> are there Siege. cats? We don't have any cats in the game yet. They but that's be a, stealth a, that's unit a really good point. Yeah, we did just add foxes, uh, which oh, are, are stealth units. 
But uh, that's a that's a great point. We definitely need to have a cat that's like a that has like an anti air weapon that can take out the birds. Oh yeah! Uh, oh, there you go. Yeah, it'd be like mm-hmm. a it would leap up and attack. Yep, exactly. There We're gonna go. have like a uh, the rabbits spawn twice as fast because they. Uh, of course. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Those are a lot of really good ideas. You know, um, uh, to get back to what what I was saying before, I remembered the point that I was trying to make. Uh, oh boy. <laughs> so what I was gonna say was, I grew up playing lots of. RTS, Warcraft, yeah. Starcraft, Command and Conquer, Age of Empires, you name it. If, if people were playing it, I was too. Even Total Annihilation. But yeah, I played a Total Annihilation. Um, so Planetary Annihilation looks interesting. But anyway, the RTS genre has died so much over like the past decade, you know? Sure, mm-hmm. there's been like, there's been like Red Alert 4, which had the co op campaign, which I really liked, but mm-hmm. not many people did, you know? And Starcraft 2 was a hit for a while, and then obviously it's been decreasing in popularity a lot. So, I, I've always been waiting for new ideas in the RTS, you know, sure. world because StarCraft Two is new, but it's still no, StarCraft. It's you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's, it's totally a new just coat of paint. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's got a new coat of paint. There's, not, there's nothing wrong with what they did. I'm I'm glad that they came out with you know uh, something that sort of mirrored what they had done previously. But uh, and I love the campaign. I really yep. loved the StarCraft Two campaign. Yep, it was a lot of fun. I would I. You know, despite the fact it's not as groundbreaking as StarCraft One, I had a great time with it. So. Oh yeah, for sure. I, but but uh, but yeah. yeah, you're right. You're right that it does it does need a, a, some revamp because the 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 top level games tend to do the same thing over and over and over again. Yeah, and you know, current generation of gamers they didn't grow up with Warcraft Two. They didn't grow up with the original Red Alert. You know what I mean? Like, right? They didn't grow up with those games that were so groundbreaking and so tone setting for the entire genre. Right now, they're all yeah. growing up with Minecraft. Yeah, that's they are. They are. <laughs> I mean, that's, Microcraft. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. yeah <laughs> when is there going to be a micro or a Minecraft RTS? Anyway, I'm, I, I imagine think there, it already exists. Yeah, there are some. There are a couple of voxel based RTSs. Um, oh wow! There's a, yeah. there's a castle one. Uh, I don't know. Where, uh, castle Panic or something like. No, that uh, that's a board game. That's a board game. <laughs> that's okay. No worries. Uh, castle. Uh, um, I don't remember, uh, but there are a couple of uh, voxel RTSs. It's interesting because that's another, um, that's a genre that I don't think anyone's actually really successfully figured out, which is the, it sort of big, big boy, angry birds. Um, right. You know, someone, someone builds a, a castle, an impregnable fortress that has interesting puzzles and the other person tries to crack it. And, and people have sort of nibbled around the edges of that. Um, like Jason Rohr has a um, castle doctrine, um, another was that, castle game. That w- was that the one where it had the promotion where they gave money away to the f- people who played the beta? Oh, gosh i don't know maybe i think that was was that the one where you set up home security yep. and then yeah yep. they they had um like an a, a beta thing for that game or, or maybe it was right when it came out it was the first few days after it released um they c- kept track of all of the money people were able to steal from others and then okay. that money was converted into real dollars that were actually paypal really? to these players that's yeah. nuts that's not a- like jason Rohr to do that that's interesting I, I, uh, I mean i could be wrong it might be a similar game but i'm fairly certain that was it that sounds very oh, familiar that's, that's it cool was, it was in the gaming news right around when it was happening because it was so unheard of interesting um yeah, yeah. so there's so there's that and i know that there's a um i boy i'm i can't remember what they are but there's like stronghold i think is one is that right hmm. but no yeah. one's ever done done that like really really successfully sure. the idea of like building the castle of you know, sort of asymmetric RTS in that regard. Yeah, yeah no. Fact, it, well, um, asymmetric uh, gameplay design in general is something that's really only starting to kind of become yeah. more noticed. Yeah, yeah. it's what, something I thought think, the Wii U was going to tackle about Evolve? even more. What do, you, Evolve, what do you think about Evolve? Yeah. Evolve looks really awesome. I personally am obsessed with the game series Monster Hunter, uh, okay. and to me, it looks like Monster Hunter and Left for Dead squished cool. together. Yep. And I just. Oh man, it blows my mind. Like, Super you know, Evolve was one of those things at PAX where I really wanted to try it, but I busy. can't stand in lines. It just, I get so stir crazy and it drives me nuts. So, yeah. cause there's so much stuff to do. I'm just like, yep. when I stand in line, I'm just like, God, I could be doing five other things. Why am I doing this? Yeah. You know, I, I could be playing Lead to Fire. What am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> the booth looked awesome. I liked that big monster oh, that, that they monster had there. Was amazing. And, and yeah, that the booth, like there was so much energy there and just seeing how 
many people were there and excited for it made me excited, when, even though I didn't stand around and, and check when it out. I showed up, when I showed up on Wednesday to come set up our booth, they had that monster like half constructed. So it was oh. so cool. It was so cool seeing it put together like piece wow. by piece. You know, I saw it like just waist down at one point. And then the next time I come by, it's like the torso with like one arm hanging <laughs> off. Yeah. Yeah. It was uh, cool to see that thing go up. Yeah. I was lucky enough to get into the alpha, but I just didn't have time that weekend to really touch it very much. Uh, okay. uh, so, but I am hoping the fact that I got into that one maybe will, will help me get into future ones when I have more time because I really do want to devour that game and I'm sad that it was pushed back probably for good reasons it was pushed back but I still I want to play it it looks so cool and yep. and just that idea too the asymmetric you know gameplay uh, uh, um, there I hear I think there's a fable game that they're working on where it's five pe- five players four people are sort of the the heroes and then one person's the dungeon master sure and, right and and just oh I love those concepts I was hoping to see more of that on the Wii U we had right. zom- Zombie U when the Wii U first came out had the uh, uh, yes. the Zombie Master versus like the the survivor and the Zombie Master Zombie Lord uses the touch screen to spawn zombies strategically and the person playing the survivor looks at the television and plays a shooter yeah and, yeah I, just I, oh, I love that I thought that game was gonna be four versus one potentially but it's only one versus one and that was really yeah. disappointing to me well they were clearly just wetting their feet with it and then for some reason it didn't take off. Yeah. Well, people don't design outside of Nintendo. No one designs n- games specifically for the Wii U. Yeah. You know, unfortunately, it, it's suicide to do so. Unfortunately, yeah, it it really sucks. I wish I wish Nintendo made uh, uh, better decisions in that in that department. Yeah. And I'm, yeah I'm, I don't know. I I mean, well, I do. I certainly wish the Wii U had sold better because yeah. I would love I would love to have a reason to to make games for it. Um, but yeah, I'm sure. I'm really glad that they don't just try and compete with Sony and Microsoft on sort of standard console stuff because mm-hmm. we don't need three players in that space. We just don't. <laughs> yeah, I definitely agree with that. The only the only bummer is that all the great stuff that Nintendo does do is locked to a console that, that people aren't buying. So, yeah. yeah, until Mario Kart comes out and then everyone buys it. Well, even yeah. that though, Mario Kart, I, I you know, it was, per, it was people expected it to help them more than it really did, unfortunately. Well, I don't know if you saw this in the UK... It increased Wii U sales by like 666%, 666% yeah. which is insane. That was a Yeah, it's insane story. except when you find out the original numbers were like well, 12. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, <laughs> yeah, when, you exactly. start at, when you start at one, that's only 600, <laughs> like, or, you know, 66 copy or 66. Oh my God, 6. a million percent. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, uh, and Mario Kart for the Wii U, I'm pretty sure it's the best selling game on the Wii U, but I'm, I think it's the, the worst selling Mario Kart game. So uh, yeah, and it's so bizarre when you think of how like insanely successful the Wii was. Yep. Because I think yep. like Wii Sports is the highest selling video game of all time. Still, video game really? just because it comes no. with the Wii. <laughs> no, no way. I've seen a I list. Can't... I've seen a list. It's like I'm the... I'm gonna Wikipedia this. Okay, do it. I could be wrong, <laughs> and I want to be proved wrong if I am. But for wait, some we're talking about number highest number of units. Uh, per, yeah, yeah, highest number of units. Okay, so not dollars. No, no, no. yeah. Fact check me, please. Uh, I'm gonna fact check you right now. All you're right. gonna get. You're about to get slammed, bro. All right. <laughs> Bring it on. Oh, what have list I of best into? selling list of best selling uh, video games. Whoa. Okay. Actually, I gotta give you props. You were Wii Sports is second. Oh, okay. Um, Damn. And uh, and number one is one that shouldn't really count because it's been released on many many platforms and many different versions. Sure. And, but, Tetris. But Tetris wrecks it. Yeah. Tetris is number one. Okay. Um, Tetris is at 143 million copies sold. Wii Sports is at 82 million. And Minecraft is in third at 54 million. Oh, jeez. Um, See, I knew Wii Sports was up there. I knew it was up there in like an insanely yep. high number. Um, oh. Although it's good. it'll definitely get passed by Minecraft. It'll be interesting to see Minecraft and Tetris, like which one's going to have more staying power in the like decade long, uh, in the next decade, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that is tough. With Microsoft in charge of Minecraft, I bet you they they do like a Minecraft two or something like that. Though I bet I bet you it's what, not just like what, like what one could game. they do for Minecraft two? Like that's an interesting thought experiment. What would Minecraft two be that hasn't already been added well, in the various mods and things? I mean, it would be. I don't think that this is what they should do for Minecraft two, but I would really like to see a Minecraft MMO in which you truly it is truly simply just Minecraft, except everyone in the world at the same time. 
Because I would, I would, I only want to see this because I want to see it as a cultural experiment. What would happen? Because there would be whole societies of people that would be there to like defend the beautiful creations that they made, and oh, then yeah. other people that would want to come in and wreck it, yeah. and kick down the sandcastle. And uh, uh, that would be ridiculous. Yeah, I just, I don't know, I, I don't know what would happen, but I want to see it. <laughs> so it'd be like Dark Souls like invasions. Yeah, totally. I mean, totally <laughs> like people raiding on some on some yeah. like sacred castle that that people spent months of their lives building. Oh man, that would and then be, and, uh, and then you can make it so there's like you know you it gets harder and harder to mine the various blocks and you could have that basically be an infinite grind where you're grinding to get better and better pickaxes to mine better and better blocks. So th- such a, that at the at some point like there would be areas of the world where people have built essentially permanent castles because they're built out of materials that it literally takes a year to mine the blocks in order to get those blocks. You have to be so high level to mine those blocks <laughs> that that a low level person wouldn't be able to come in and wreck it. Um, yeah. So you'd have essentially permanent structures in the world. And then you'd have frontiers with, that is completely unmined mm-hmm. that people would be, you know, venturing off into in order to try and strike it rich with some diamond vein, you know? That would be interesting. <laughs> Perhaps though, it would take people who are just as dedicated as the people who are building those, those uh, really powerful structures who get to, you know, a similarly high level, except in terms of, of digging. And then they're right. actually able to break through those blocks. Right. You know? Yeah. You'd have, you totally have like nations at war in that regard. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and imagine, imagine the real world economy that could, could be going on if you allowed trading in that world. Oh too. yeah. It'd be like oh, Eve online. It'd be yeah. nuts. Yeah. Like so me. I don't think that that's what Minecraft two should be, but I do want to see that. I want to see that game. I want, yeah. I, I would really like to see that game. Yeah. That's an awesome yeah. concept. I, I don't know if I'd play it, man. I just want to punch trees. That's all. Oh I yeah. Do. No, I told, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to play it either. I definitely wouldn't want to play it, but I would want to, would I just, would want to hear about the stories that came out of it. Yeah, exactly. I, I'd watch the YouTube videos of it, but that's it. Yeah. yeah. So we don't want to take too much of your time. So we're going to start wrapping up. The way we end each of our shows is we end with a question. What we do is we have the previous guest ask a question for the next guest as it as it is. So we have a guest for you from the previous guest. And then uh, we're asking a question from the what previous did I say? Guest. A guest from the previous <laughs> guest. Yes, we have a guest from the pre- we have a question from the previous <laughs> guest for you. And then we task you with to come up with a question for the next guest. Okay. So it, this this is the section that's not necessarily about video games. Some some guests make them video game questions. Some don't. So the previous question was Star Wars or Indiana Jones, and which movie is your favorite and why? Huh. Wait. So which movie between those two or yes, any yeah. movie? Well, it's do you prefer Star Wars to Indiana Jones? Yeah. And, and then, then which the, movie of those yeah. of those franchises is oh, your favorite? Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. 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 Oh, that is really good because everyone always asks Star Trek or Star Wars. Um, yeah. I, oh, that's really good. Um, that is so tough. Well, you know, until like, I actually think that Star Wars is just starting to show its age. I think sure. that, I think that actually it, it managed to, to hang on until about five years ago. When, and now it's just barely starting to show its age. And I think sure. Indiana Jones still does it for me. And I, okay. you know, you know, I think part of it, why is because I feel like as I've gotten older, there's less and less of the world that you can really explore. And like Indiana Jones, for whatever reason, gives me that childhood sense that like there's weird, crazy, scary places in the world left to, you know, unexplored territory. Oh, on yeah, our totally. Planet, sure. You know, and like, it's weird. Like I'm an adult and I've, I've been to China, which is like basically the opposite side of the world. And yeah, like, yeah. you know, and I've, I've traveled a fair amount and, uh, and it's really nice to, to have that like feeling of like, to me, I just want, I like being in that, that mindset of like, of, of being an explorer. And that's, to me, that's what Indiana Jones is. So I got to go with Indiana Jones. Um, Good pick. and, uh, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, obviously. Yeah, um, of course. Definitely. So, yep, I agree yeah. with that. Yeah, and as far as Indiana Jones versus Star Wars, at least Indiana Jones only has one lousy movie in the franchise, whereas oh, Star God, Wars... Oh, God, but it is so bad. <laughs> no, it is so bad. Yeah, it, that is, you, that you is didn't quite... You like the CG monkeys and oh, my Shia God. LaBeouf swinging on vines? So, oh, you're talking I about the... I had forgotten about that movie. That's <laughs> yes. how bad, like, because I was like, I, I don't even think about it as part of the same I was like, which oh, one are they man, talking sorry, about sorry, that's guys. so bad? I was like, I, did he really not like the third one that oh, much? sorry, guys. No, 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 no. Last Crusade's great, man. Yeah. It's, it's good. I mean, it's sort of, it's a little too comedic, but it's good. And yeah. uh, but Honestly, Crystal my, Skull. Oof. I, I, I like uh, uh, Last Crusade. 
more than uh, uh, Temple of Doom, to be honest. It's, it's good. Last Crusade's good. It is. Yeah. But, but uh, Raiders is the best, of course. Yeah, Raiders, Raiders is not, just... I love Raiders. It's... Oh, that, I just love that movie so much. So that, that question was asked by what Mike McCain? Yeah, Mike McCain of Hairbrain Schemes, um, right? Artist for Shadowrun Returns. Yeah, nice. and yeah. Dragonfall. Uh, so, so what? Uh, what would your question be for our next guest? You can take a, a minute to think. Yeah, about and it some examples of the questions we've got in the past is like, what was your favorite time in your life? What's a TV show that you like that you think jumped the shark, or you think was, was canceled, canceled too early, early or? Um, right. Or what boss from what video game would you would you take and put in a different game? And what game would that be? You know, those kinds of questions. Yeah, can be anything you'd like. Game related right. or otherwise. All right. I want to hear your next guest convince your audience <laughs> that whatever he or she is most passionate about in the world, aside from video games, they should be that passionate about too. Okay. Okay. That's, that's a, It's a little more of a... Of, yeah, uh, that's more of a challenge. challenge but yeah, but no, all right. I, I, like I like that. that. I, like I can. That I'll too. phrase it, uh, Mr. Trebek. I will phrase it in the form of a question. <laughs> <laughs> what are you aside from video games and your significant others? What are you most passionate about, and why? And tell the audience, and why? Why should the the shark Shark Tank audience be as passionate about this thing as you? That's that's an awesome question. I think that's my favorite question yeah. so far since we've started doing this show Sweet. because it's. <laughs> That is a good question. Our question to you would be, what is your answer to that one, Andy? Oh, shit. <laughs> we, always get our, we always get them. We never expect it. <laughs> oh, that's such a good question. Uh, okay, well, I, I, have, I guess I have two answers for you. I, 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 had a, I probably would have had a different answer as of like a year ago. I, I used to be a really hardcore Ultimate Frisbee player, and I loved it, loved it. But over the years, I've been... Developing injury after injury, and I can't oh. play like I used to. Oh, I'm sorry to hear um, that. So I, I would love to describe. No, I will just describe that. Even though I would not say that it's probably, probably the number one thing, but I think it's fun to talk about. Sure. So ultimate frisbee to me is like the ultimate like indie video game, except it's a sport um, because <laughs> people are still discovering the sport, and people are mm -hmm. still discovering strategies in the sport. People are still discovering ways to even throw a frisbee. Oh, um, I love, I love frisbee, like frisbee golf and stuff. It's, it's really cool. Yep. And, and so it, it's, it's a fantastic spectator sport because it, the frisbee actually moves fairly slowly. And so you get like the speed of a, um, of a game like soccer or a game or football or basketball or something like that. But there's so much more acrobatics that you can do when you, when the, the, the object that you're chasing down moves you know, moves more slowly and in more interesting ways than you can with a, you know, you know, than a ball does. Sure. Um, you know, you end up with people laying out and, and, uh, you know, diving over the line and then throwing it back in before they hit the ground, that kind of thing. And, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's an incredibly good spectator sport. And it's one that, uh, it's a little, I guess there's a little bit more barrier to entry to start playing because throwing a Frisbee is not quite as natural as just like throwing a ball. But I find it to be an, an incredibly rewarding sport, partially because, because the culture around the sport is, is when the sport started becoming popular, it was about, um, or that there's, there's actually a part in the, the, the rule book that, that says that the players must adhere to what's called spirit of the game mm -hmm. because it's a, it's supposed to be a self referenced, uh, refereed game. Yeah. It's the onus is upon the players to actually call fouls and call f fouls fair. And, uh, to me, that's really kind of what a sport should be about. Absolutely. Um, you, you should be playing it honorably and you should be playing it with a sense of, of, um, that you are responsible for the, for the entire game and for both, both teams. Yeah. And not just for getting away with what you can. Yeah, um, that, that's so, what kills soccer for me is, is yep. the flops, man. I just, I can't stand it. Yeah. Yep. So it, and for, I mean, over, as ultimates become more and more popular, of course, at the high levels of play, uh, people start abusing it. And now they have observers and refs and stuff, stuff, stuff like that. But yeah. at, at like lower levels of play, the people really still do depend upon that, that sense of honor. Um, so it's sort of built into the DNA of the sport, which which I just love. That's really cool. Yeah, that's that's a perfect example of a of and, the answer to your question. And you said you had question. two answers. Do you want to give both? Sure. Or do you have time? Yeah, sure. Why not? I mean, I've I've built as an indie. I've built a couple of games about ecosystems, and and uh, um, right. And I want to return to that because I, I I love the idea that like my sort of most magical experiences in my lifetime have been uh, moments usually in solitude in the wild often with with animals um, mm -hmm. like in in particular one time uh, I remember snorkeling in the Galapagos Islands there were hammerheads in in the water that day and so you know I was kind of a little bit on edge 
And uh, but the the hammerheads were kind of well below the surface, which usually means that they're not they're not feeding, they're not dangerous. Sure. I remember, you know, you know, you you get pretty tense when you see sharks in the water, but you know, it was it was safe to be there. And I saw at what at one point I was with uh, um, another guy who's a guide, um, a, a Ecuadorian guy who's done a lot of this kind of thing, um, mm-hmm. and uh, a, a manta ray that. By his account, and he's seen a lot of them, um, mm-hmm. so it's not just me saying this. Sure. By his account, we had a 22-foot wingspan Whoa. appeared out of, out of nowhere beneath us Jeez. and just started gl- just started gliding like it's like it's flying at, underneath the water about about like 10 feet down directly underneath me with a couple of remoras on its back. Those sure. are the fish that stick to it. Yeah, and and it's just like this thing didn't didn't have a care in the world, and sure. it was it was. You know, it's it's gliding along, and it's so interesting having that perspective reversed of being above it rather than below something that appears to be flying. Mm-hmm. And it gave me this like sense of 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 peace um, that being you know, and and relaxed me in a, in a way that like I think back on it and think to myself that like that's the ideal that I strive towards in in my everyday life. You know, to to be the manta ray. <laughs> um, yeah. and, that's uh, so cool. Yeah, it was really it was magical because it's like the whole land, the whole earth was moving underneath me. Um, yeah, that sounds and, like the uh, sort of thing where like if you're if you're having a bad time, you could close your eyes and just sort of bring yourself back to that to really put yourself yep. back into a good place. Yep, yep, exactly, exactly. And that it's something. Yeah, I always I always think back on that experience with uh with that this sort of sense of wonder and and uh, and peace, which you know is is nice. Well, that's that's awesome. Thank you so much for for answering your question uh, uh, <laughs> twofold, and and yeah, I guess you know that 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 wraps things up. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Andy, for for being on here with us. And yeah, uh, thanks for having me on. Yeah, no problem at all. So so once again, uh, this was Dane and Tim. And thank you so much for listening to Name Your Game. We work on several other projects here at SharkTank.com. We're a nonprofit, volunteer-driven gaming and geek culture site based in Seattle. Uh, We do local convention coverage, Let's Plays, tabletop strategy, and game reviews, among other things. Please like and subscribe if you want to support us and our work. And you can feel free to leave any feedback you want through comments on YouTube or right there on our website. Or you can email us at nyg at SharkTank.com. Remember, that's shark with a C, so S-H-A-R-C. Yeah, and uh, we have our next guest lined up, right? We do. It's Nick Wozniak from uh, Yacht Club Games, the lead artist for Shovel Knight. Oh, I'm so excited. I love Shovel Knight. So let's been Name Your Game. Until next time, guys.